guys, what's up? My name is Dom. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new to my channel, I typically make bookish content, movie content, and anything else in between because I like to do whatever I want on this channel and tonight is going to be movie content. For today's video, we are going to go over the 15 movies I watched in the months of August and September. I have a lot to say with so little time to say it, so let's jump right into the video. So the first movie I watched in August was actually a rewatch. I decided to rewatch Titanic, and this is 100% because of the submersible business that happened earlier in the year. Listen, it was a great time to be on Twitter, and all these memes about the Titanic, y'all are some funny motherfuckers. And did you guys <laughs> did you guys see that article that said there was an uptick in streams from My Heart Will Go On? It was like half a million streams, and two of them are mine. This is actually only the second time I've seen this movie from beginning to end. I have rewatched this movie several times. This is it's one of those movies where if I'm clicking through the channels and this is on, I'll stop and watch it. And rarely ever do I catch it at the beginning. I usually catch it when the boat's already sinking, but I decided to rewatch it from the beginning. Three and a half hours. I was cooking dinner, I was peeling my potatoes while I was watching, I was cutting some veggies. I was having a grand old time. To this day, I am still amazed by the practical effects of this movie and the stunts. I, mi I just miss when movies had practical effects. I'm so tired of CGI. And all the scenes that used to make me cry still make me ball my eyes out. So then I went to the theaters and saw 2023's Haunted Mansion. This is about a haunted mansion. <laughs> it is based on the ride at the Disney parks, which is a great ride. And I do love the Eddie Murphy version, which I am just learning the general public apparently thinks it's a shit movie. I just think y'all don't know how to have fun. I love that movie to pieces. However, that movie does not have as many Easter eggs as you would hope. So I was actually excited to learn about this movie. However, do I think it was a waste of money and I should have waited until it was on streaming? Yes. The first three quarters of this movie were rough. The acting in this movie is pretty bad, which is shocking because I've seen everyone, minus the child, I've seen everyone involved in this movie and something else where they did a great job. So I don't know what happened here. And because of the bad acting, a lot of the jokes fell flat. It's a lot of corny humor, which I know is what Disney's known for. But I miss the days when corny Disney humor was for the whole family to enjoy. Now I feel like in their live actions, they make it so they make it so corny only like five year olds would laugh at it. There's a lot of weird CGI in this movie that was just very uncanny to look at, and the movie felt a lot longer than it is. But also having said that, I said the first three quarters, the last quarter was much more enjoyable, and I found myself more engrossed in the film. But the first three quarters just really tanked it. I gave this film 2.5 out of 5 stars. It was cool seeing the Easter eggs to the ride I love so much, but didn't really save the film. And I think, honestly think Disney really shot themselves in the foot having this film come out in July of all months. September, forgivable, but July? Okay. So the next movie I watched was an anime movie. It was pouring rain here in Philly and I'm like, oh, I need a cozy movie. So I decided to watch In This Corner of the World. And it's about a woman just living her life in Japan during the Second World War. Okay. And I believe she moves into a town that's very close to where the bombs dropped. And I kind of got what I wanted. I wanted something cozy. I mean, it's, it's a weird word to use given the depiction of this movie. But it was cozy in its own way and it was very cute in its own way. This whole movie, I should say, is more so like a slow slice of life. From what I gather, the point of this movie wasn't to show the horrors of World War II. It was, it was more so to show how slow and mundane life actually was outside of everything we see in documentaries and in biographies and in autobiographies. Because obviously those things are going to talk about the really important events, but everything in between, people were just living their lives. However, even though the slow pacing was purposeful, I, it was just too slow for my personal taste. And it made the movie feel a lot longer than it is, which is saying something because this movie's already like three hours long. But certain scenes made up for that, so I gave this film 3.5 out of 5 stars. After this, I continued my journey of trying to watch all the movies that won Best Picture at the Oscars. So the next movie we have won Best Picture in 1932, and it's called Cimarron. This movie is when the Oklahoma Territory opens up for settlement, so a guy is trying to grab every opportunity he can, and then his wife has to stay behind to take care of the family, yada yada yada. It's, it's this movie, I girl, I had such a hard time with. It's easy to follow while you're on your phone, but I was on my phone, this movie, and it's a long movie, I think I was on my phone for like seven-eighths of this entire movie, because I was just so 
fucking bored. It's one of the most boring movies I've ever seen and it's boring to the point where I actually don't remember much. Like I can remember the big plot points but I can't remember much in between. And it made one of my worst films of the year. I gave this one out of five stars. After that I watched the movie that won Best Picture in 1933 and that is Grand Hotel. And this is about multiple people who are staying at a hotel in Berlin and we just get to see their lives through misery, anguish, whatever else is bothering them. Drew Barrymore's grandfather is in this, John Barrymore, looking like Walt Disney. And I did like this better than Cimarron. Even though I liked it better than Cimarron, I did think this movie was just okay. I do appreciate the exploration of different relationship dynamics and all the different types of people they had. It just couldn't fully engross me to where I wanted it to. My attention was waning a bit. I was on my phone sometimes. This was my first Joan Crawford movie because I was reading Mommy Dearest. I actually do like her acting. But this is also my first Greta Garbo movie and I, at the vet hospital I used to work at we had a dog named Greta Garbo and everyone loved her enough because everyone loved the actress and I was like, ooh, I should finally watch something with her. Gotta say, not impressed. <laughs> ooh, hopefully the fans don't come for my ass for that, but I was not impressed with her acting in this movie. I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not going to write her off just because I haven't seen anything else, but this is one of those films where I thought it was just okay and don't have much more else to say which rhymes, and I gave it three out of five stars. Then I headed back to the theater to watch Talk To Me. In this movie, there is a hand that you hold and you have to say a special phrase and then not only can you see a ghost, but the ghost can take over you. And our main character gets highly addicted to this. I'm really, really impressed with how this movie turned out. Honestly, I was expecting to leave the theater being like, okay, that was just okay, two out of five stars. But as of now, this is one of my top 10 films of the year. This entire thing is an allegory for drug use and I think they did such a great job with that especially with the direction they chose to go because something I always heard in school you know whenever we learned about drugs and health class was that sometimes it really does take someone just the one time to get highly addicted to something and that's what happens with our main character she does it the one time gets incredibly addicted and then continues to ignore the consequences afterwards not only do they show that they show they do a great job showing why she gets into it in the first place because I feel like when it comes to drug addiction past trauma is something people People ignore because oftentimes when people are highly addicted to drugs it's because they have a lot of shit going on in their lives and in this movie they chose to depict that and I really appreciate that there is incredibly disorienting camera work in this and I mean that in a good way it made me feel as crazy and taken aback as our main character the ghost designs are amazing people in this film acted their asses off and I wish I wish award seasons didn't didn't ignore horror because this the, the main actress I think her name's Sophie Wilde she needs she she needs at least a nomination and so does the so does the boy Riley the guy who played Riley he needs a nomination for supporting actor and something specifically for one scene he just he, chills absolute chills and I think my favorite part about this movie is that for the end of it they saw an opportunity and grabbed it because I was halfway through the movie and I thought to myself. You know, it would be really cool if this movie ended a certain way and if it ended exactly like this. And then the movie ended exactly as I wanted it to. So those filmmakers, they saw an opportunity and they took it. They did not miss it at all. So if you're into horror, I highly recommend y'all add this to your horror list if you haven't seen it. I gave this movie 4.5 out of 5 stars. I went to the theater again the day after and I saw The Last Voyage of the Demeter. This movie is about the captain's logs in the book Dracula by Bram Stoker. I was really excited to see this film. When I first saw the trailer, I thought it was spooky, scary, and I thought I, th I just thought it was going to be a fun time. And it's finally like another Dracula movie, but a different but a different idea around it. But then I got really scared when I saw the reviews because I saw that this movie bombed, but I was like, whatever, I don't, I, I'm gonna see it. I was looking forward to it for months, let's do it. Uh, but yeah, it bombed, <laughs> bombed for a reason. The trailer made this out to be so much scarier than it is. It's labeled horror, but to me, this just feels more like a drama. The stakes in this movie felt incredibly low, which made for a boring movie and long. This movie felt so much longer than it actually is. So on Twitter, I gave this movie three out of five stars, like a low three out of five because I, I liked the concept and I felt really bad, but yeah, I've lowered it to two out of five. So then I decided to rewatch a movie. I went to the Franklin Institute here in Philly and they had a Disney exhibit. So I was, I was feeling a certain way. And this exhibit included a lot of artifacts, like real artifacts that Walt Disney himself used. One of those artifacts is the book that you see in the beginning of the Sleeping Beauty movie. And I was like, oh my God, you know what movie I need to watch now? 
Sleeping Beauty. So I rewatched Sleeping Beauty and I had a grand time with this. I love the music in this and the clapbacks in this movie are fucking insane. The last movie I watched in August is a horror movie called Skin of Merrick. This is about two kids whose parents disappear and so do the doors and windows to their house. This is such a neat concept and some of the reviews for this were raving because I, I remember when this came out and people said this is one of the scariest and most unsettling movies they've ever seen. So I was excited to watch this. Um, unfortunately, I gave it two out of five stars. It's, it's just such a weird movie just because of the framing and everything. Like, you have to be in a specific setting for this movie to really work. I feel like in order for this to work, you need to be in the same setting as these kids. Like, you need to be in a windowless and doorless area. So I tried to create that in my living room. I, I shut the blinds, I turned the lights off, but it, it still didn't really work for me. I think what this movie was going for was trying to get you to reach into that childhood fear and make you afraid the way you were as a kid. Because, so the framing of this movie, it, it's, it's, it's really weird. You don't actually see any action in this film because all that's on screen is like a wall or a TV screen. However, you hear the action. And as a kid, I mean, at least in my case, if I was ever scared of something, it wasn't, especially the dark, which is the majority of this movie, it wasn't what I was seeing that scared me, it was the noises I was hearing. So that's why I believe that's what the filmmakers were going for. However, uh, it, it, it does make for a boring movie. If I squint a little, some scenes were unsettling, but it, it's, it's weird. This movie is like simultaneously an unsettling movie, but also one of the most boring movies I've ever seen in my life. The only scene that genuinely creeped me out was the very last two minutes. But even then, that's kind of stretching it a bit, so I gave this film two out of five stars. <laughs> So the first movie I watched in September was a silent film and another John Barrymore film and that is 1920's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I reacted to this movie and everything I had to say is in that reaction so I really don't feel like repeating myself. I'll link it up above but in summary I think they did a great job with this. It's a great personification of good and evil. The makeup's on point with this. John Barrymore as Dr. Jekyll is a very pretty man and as Mr. Hyde he is creepy as hell. I gave this 3 out of 5 stars. So then I went to the theater again. I watched The Nun 2. This is a sequel to The Nun which is a movie in the Conjuring universe and it's about a demon who manifests itself as a nun. I was so hesitant going into this film because I hated The Nun. It, it made my one of my worst films of whichever year I watched it in. It wasn't scary, it was boring, yada yada yada. So I don't know why I chose to spend money on this rather than waiting for it to come out on streaming. But here we are. That being said, did I find this movie scary? No. But did I find it miles ahead of the first one? Yeah, like I actually genuinely enjoyed this film. I found it to be entertaining, which is all that I ask. If I'm not scared but still entertained for a horror movie, that, that, that is fine. Just the acting's better, the direction's better, the writing's better, the cinematography's better. Just everything about this movie is just so much better than the first one. Like whoever made this clearly had an idea they wanted, whereas the first one I feel like they were just doing fuck all. And another reason I was hesitant going into this is because it's the same director as The Conjuring 3 and The Curse of La Llorona both of which I fucking hated. But this director's at three for three, so good for him. I gave this movie 3.5 out of five stars. So then I watched another older film, and that is 1944's Gaslight. In this movie, a woman marries a man she had just met about like a week or two prior, and she notices things are changing in her household, like the gas lights are going dark, she's hearing noises, but her husband keeps telling her it's not happening, it is all in her head. I reacted to this movie too, and I said a lot in that video, so I highly recommend watching that. I'll link that up above. This movie has the best depiction of mental abuse I've ever seen on film. If you don't know, this is where the term gaslighting comes from. And knowing that term, you're, you are going to know the plot twist of this film, but I feel like it helped me watch it in a different light. Like, I feel like the audience watching this in 1944 is definitely going to watch it in a different way than we are in 2023, knowing the word gaslighting. So knowing the word, I was able to see, you know, I was able to see the seeds of foreshadowing. I caught on to the husband's tricks right away. So I I was viewing him differently than they than they were possibly viewing him in 1944. I was so angry at him throughout that entire film. I think it's just so interesting. This movie is so critically acclaimed that we created a psychological term because of it. And this made one of my top 10 movies of the year. I gave it five out of five stars. Then I watched A Haunting in Venice. This is the third movie and the name I always have, tr I struggle saying, in the Hercule Perot series. In this movie, he goes to Venice, he goes to see an orphanage, and things are amiss. Shit happens. It's a murder mystery. The trailer made this out to be a horror film, and I was like, ain't no way, because that's not the vibe of the first two movies. 
So I went into the film thinking it was going to be the vibe of the first movie that I've seen. It, good thing I did that because I was correct. Same vibe, wasn't scary at all. And unfortunately in my case, I did figure out who done it within the first 10 minutes of the film, but it didn't really take away my enjoyment. I was very entertained watching all the seeds being planted and then seeing how everything came together in the end and how certain plot points, how they would explain those away and blah blah blah. So despite knowing who done it, I don't think it was a waste of my time. I did give this film 3.5 out of 5 stars. Then I watched the movie Ouija. This is about a group of friends whose friend died, so they decide to mess with a Ouija board. For the longest time, Cimarron was my worst movie of the year and then I watched this. This is the worst movie I watched in 2023. This is unbelievably bad. It's one of those movies where the creators clearly had ideas for like five different movies, didn't know what they wanted to do, so they shoved it all into one. It just felt like too many storylines and their connections were hanging by threads. The camera work was inconsistent. Some of these scenes were beautifully shot, actually. I will give credit where credit is due, but in other scenes, especially the like action scenes, it was so shaky, it was almost nauseating. And then the thing that really got me was the jump scares and how they didn't work. Because I've seen movies with shitty jump scares. So like I always say on this channel, jump scares do always work for me. Not because I find them genuinely scary, but just in the sense like, yeah, if you're gonna play something loud in my ear, it's gonna it's gonna make me react whether it's involuntary or not. But even then, in the past there have been movies where I watched and I can predict when a jump scare could happen and I would predict what the jump scare was going to be, like a man falling out of a locker or something like that. But it, it, it would still get me because it's the loud noise. The loud noises are what gets me. But in this movie, and not only did I predict when they were gonna happen, not only did I predict what they were gonna be, but they didn't work. The loud noises didn't get me at all. Like, I'm probably the most sensitive person to when it comes to jump scares and you couldn't even get me to jump with your jump scares. How weak of a writer are you? And then not only that, but it's boring, but it's so boring it can't be considered a so bad it's good movie. Girl, how do you make- I don't understand how a movie this bad could be made. One, one out of five stars. So then the last movie I watched in September is another horror movie, and it's Mike Flanagan's Ouija Origin of Evil, which is a prequel to Ouija that absolutely nobody asked for. But surprisingly, it was actually kind of good. So this movie makes a story of the only remotely interesting part of the first movie, which is the, the history of the house and the Ouija board. And because it's Mike Flanagan, there were no cheap jump scares, and I love the use of shadows. He does amazing shadow work in his films. I should—I mean, I don't know if his shadow work is just lighting in general, but which, whichever, whatever it's called, Mike Flanagan's a master at it. That being said, when it comes to the narrative, a lot of people were saying this is a very emotional movie, of course, because it's Mike Flanagan. In his TV shows, he is a master at scaring you, but also making you cry. I think he's a little weak when it comes to movies. I was entertained in this movie, but I wasn't crying. It was, I wasn't as emotional as I thought it was going to be. And I thought the narrative as a whole was just okay in the end. So I gave this film 3 out of 5 stars. And that is it for this video. Let me know down below if you guys have seen any of these films. Let me know what films you guys were watching at the end of summer, early fall. Were you also getting ready for spooky season that early in the year like I was? If you like this video, give it a big thumbs up, comment, subscribe. Y'all know the drill. Without further ado, I'm going to peace out and I'll see you guys later. Ciao, tutti.